Welcome to the Westerdijk Institute. The institute was established in 1904 with the aim to preserve the fungal biodiversity of the world. Uh, we see Johanna Westerdijk here with uh, one of her technicians. This movie was taken around 1946, just after the war, and from there the collection really started to expand exponentially. Now the isolates that you see in this movie are still in the institute and they form the core of the collection. We have the most diverse uh, fungal collection that's actually also a living collection in the world. We have more than 100,000 strains. Most of these strains are filamentous fungi and yeasts, but we also have uh, water fungi, uh, bacteria, phages and uh, plasmids. Now we have a few uh, techniques to keep these uh, cultures alive. One is on agar. We do not do that for too many um, of our strains. It's quite uh, laborious. Uh, then we have two very nice techniques that we use. Uh, the first one is the liquid nitrogen of cryopreservation. There we uh, preserve the strains at very cold temperatures in liquid nitrogen tanks. Uh, the other method is lyophilization or freeze drying. So this is then where the water is taken out of the cells and it is then kept and preserved in a powder form. Both of these methods have been tested and even for 30, 40 years it's still viable. So strains from uh, the 19th century can be used by researchers in their uh, research. There are very few institutes like the Westerdijk Institute globally. It's unique in the sense that it has this massive collection of fungi, but it also has the various research groups that improve the quality of the collection, constantly adding new data, improving the knowledge we have of the holdings within the collection. And then the institute has a very applied approach to research, be it agriculture, health or industry. Initially, all fungi were identified based on morphology only. Now we have state-of-the-art molecular techniques uh, from DNA barcoding to whole genome analysis and metabolite profiling, which enables us to not only characterize these fungi for identity, but also for activity. Entering all those data into a system is absolutely crucial for the researchers and also for the end users of the website. Currently, we are working on genome comparisons and genome clustering. And as you know, genomes are huge. And so this is a, a huge challenge computer-wise. Plant pathogenic fungi contribute a significant portion of food loss globally. And given the fact that by 2050, we need to double the amount of food produced on our planet, this is of crucial importance. The group works a lot with soil microbiology, specifically focusing on soil health, where we characterize fungal pathogens in soil, but also look for beneficial microbes that we can use for biocontrol. These are unicellular fungi. They range from beneficial microbes that are used in, for instance, bread making, and in brewing, and in wine making. And of course, they can also be very detrimental, causing diseases, serious diseases to humans. We are trying to understand the diversity of those yeasts based on evolution. So we use DNA-based techniques mainly for understanding the evolutionary history of those yeasts. And then we see that species that we think are closely related based on the previously used techniques like the phenotype, how they look like, and their food preferences, eh, that these are widely different. And that was impossible to understand without DNA methods. One thing that we particularly are recognizing much more uh, during actually the last 10 years is the presence of hybrid yeasts. We see many hybrids in the clinical field. What's happening worldwide now is that we see an increase in antifungal resistance, fungal isolates in the clinic 
And we see also novel fungal pathogens that are suddenly in the clinic causing problems. So what we do here in our laboratory is to investigate where this antifungal resistance is coming from. We investigate the genetics behind that and also the phenotypic characterization. So how virulent are those novel fungal pathogens compared to the old ones that we have already in our culture collection. The whole genome sequencing approach that we are using in our laboratory is nanopore sequencing and that is a very novel sequencing approach and the specialty of this is that it's creating very long DNA sequencing reads. So the host pathogen system that we use is Galeria melonella and that's a greater wax mod larvae and we inject them with the fungal pathogens of interest and then we compare the effect what the different isolates have on these larvae. Then we start diving into the genetic difference of these isolates. There are still a lot of problems regarding food spoilage and growth of fungi in the indoor environments. Governments and industries ask different kind of questions. They can be either simple regarding what kind of fungus is growing on my cheese, but we also are asked to give uh, our expert opinion about more fundamental problems. It's good to know your enemy. By knowing all the details of such a fungus, you can find and think about new strategies to slow down growth or to even stop growth in a food product or in an indoor environment. We notice that many people lack experience in mycology and that's why we teach the course on food and indoor fungi to help those people to correctly identify the fungi that are occurring on food but also give a lot of background information about physiology of fungi and also mycotoxin production of those uh, organisms. The bio-based economy of course wants us to switch from traditional processes like chemical processes to more bio-based processes and fungi are quite critical there because they have a huge range of possible applications. For instance, we need to have in our diet a certain amount of protein, but animal production is not really sustainable. So fungal protein would be a really good alternative, and some of our research focuses on developing fungi to become protein factories. We first work on understanding fungi, and in my group particularly, we look at how fungi deal with biomass, and we try to understand how fungi use these compounds for themselves. And once we understand how they use them for themselves, we can also try to understand how those processes could benefit all kinds of applications. We try to look at the diversity of fungi and the total potential that there is in diversity, and then pick from that those ones that are particularly suitable for a certain application. Here at the Vestadec, we have plenty of strains that we can screen for interesting biological activities and find new molecules. Our first strategy is to start from the genomes and the genes to identify new molecules that we can then test for biological activities. And the second strategy is the exact opposite. So we start from finding interesting biological activities from fungi then try to identify the molecule and in the end link this molecule to the genes. And with this knowledge, we can transfer the genes into another fungus in which we control the expression of the genes and thus we can produce these molecules. You look at biodiversity and you think it's about the bear or the deer or the tree. It's not only that most of the biodiversity is minute and you cannot see it with the naked eye. These microbes are essential and that's where we come in.